Good evening and welcome. Uh, we will be in 1 Kings <laughs> chapter 9. We are part way through the chapter, but chapter 9 of 1 Kings. As we begin tonight, let's uh, go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the wonders of this day, for the beauty that you've allowed us and the time you've allowed us to come together to study your word and comfort of this building. We're thankful for this band of disciples that meets here from time to time, and we're grateful for the leadership we have with the elders, that they have dedicated their lives to serving you and that they've dedicated themselves to leading this congregation in the way we should go. We pray your blessings on them and their families. We want to also remember, Heavenly Father, that uh, you have allowed us to have your word to study, that you wanted us to be able to reference what you've done for and with mankind in the past and what you have promised us for the future. We thank you that we can read about your relationship with mankind and each of the uh, times that you've dealt with man with the patriarchal age, with the time that the law was delivered through Moses to the Israelites, and in the present day, the Christian age, we can read about Jesus and why he took upon himself a robe of flesh, that he came and dwelled among man, taught us many things, both by word and by the way he lived his life. And we have these things r related to us in your word. We're grateful that he was willing to allow himself to die for sins that he did not commit. And we thank you for him. We thank you for sending him. We thank you, Heavenly Father, that uh, as each of the classes that are being conducted this night are done, we pray it will be done in accordance with your will. We pray that much good will be done in learning from your word. May we be able to apply your word properly so that we can gain wisdom. We want to pray for several of our number who are suffering from ailments of the flesh. We have very many. We want to pray uh, for Rachel McMullen, who is sister-in-law of Linda Estlin. And... Uh, she lives in Pickerington, and she has been having some health problems recently, and so has Linda recently. She's been having problems herself. So we want to pray for your blessings on them. May it be your will to bless each of them. We want to also remember uh, Ruth McElwee, who will soon be having uh, surgery on her bile duct. We pray that that will go well that they will be able to clear up whatever problem there is and that she will be able to heal quickly from that. Uh, Abby Bryan will soon be having some foot surgery just in a, a few days. We pray that things will go well with her. We want to also uh, remember Bonnie Stimmel has requested prayers for herself, for her parents, for her brother. We pray your blessings on them and for her daughter as well. Pray your blessings on each. Tracy Taylor had a stroke recently, we pray that she will be able to recover fully from that. And so we pray for your blessings on her and upon her husband and their daughter. We just want to remember Ron and Janet Simmons as they both suffer from different ailments but are 
having these problems at the same time. We pray your blessings on them. May they be able to recover from these completely. And Ron was here last week. We pray your blessings that he may continue to improve. We want to remember Juanita Clark, who has been having some problems recently, and we pray that you will bless her as well. We're thankful, Heavenly Father, that we can come to you at times like this on behalf of ourselves and on behalf of others. We're thankful that Tina Shaw has improved greatly, that she was able to go home, and we pray your, that she will continue to improve, and we, we're grateful for her her husband David is, is uh, he's been seen to her care. Also, Janet Doak has been experiencing health problems recently. We pray may it be your will to bless her as well. We pray, Heavenly Father, to ask your forgiveness wherein we may have fallen short of what you would have us be. We don't offer any excuse, but we simply say, inasmuch as we repent of our sins, confess our sins to you, may it be your will to remember our sins against us no more. We pray for this nation we live in. It seems that not only in this nation, but other nations, that it's difficult for mankind to find time for you to try to do your will. But we pray that as citizens of this country, may we be able to try to influence those about us by the way that we live our lives, that hopefully this uh, nation will have repentance and that we will draw closer to you in the future. These favors and blessings we ask and thanks we give in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay, now. Let's go way back here. I have so many markers in here, I keep finding the wrong ones here, so I need to, there we go. First Kings chapter nine. Now we read through several verses here, and so um, we'll probably read a couple of verses we read last week. Um, so let's start with verse 16, First Kings chapter nine. And remember, um, well, let's read 16 first. For Pharaoh, king of Egypt, had gone up and captured Gezer and burned it with fire and killed the Canaanites who lived in the city and had given it as a dowry to his daughter, Solomon's wife. So, reference. Reference. When it talks about uh, Pharaoh's daughter. Same book, 1 Kings chapter 3, verse 1. Then Solomon formed a marriage alliance with Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and took Pharaoh's daughter and brought her to the city of David until he had finished building his own house and the house of the Lord and the wall around Jerusalem. So it's his house and the house of the Lord and the wall, they were working on a wall for defensive purposes. So anyway, that refers back what we just read in chapter nine. So back to chapter nine. So Pharaoh had driven the Canaanites out of the city that they had, and he presented it to his daughter as a dowry. 17, or do you have any comments before we go on? Okay. So Solomon rebuilt Gezer and the lower Beth Haran, okay, uh, and Baalath and Tamar in the wilderness in the land of Judah, and all the story cities which Solomon had, even the cities for his chariots and the cities for his horsemen, and all that uh, it pleased Solomon to build in Jerusalem, in Lebanon, and in all the land under his rule. And we know one of those places where he had uh, horseman was Megiddo, which overlooks the Jezreel Valley, and it's a strategic point, so it would be sort of like putting a fort there, and that's, it isn't mentioned in this passage, but that's one of the places where he had horsemen. And the reason they would do that 
because the Via Maris, the way of the sea, not you know on the seashore itself, but not far from there, working up through what they call the Shephela, which would be the foothills, and then eventually get up into the mountains of Judea and on further north. If you can control the trade route, then you can control the culture. And that's what wouldn't be just Solomon, but since he was in this area, that's what he's trying to do. And so that's why he has all of these things. Uh, verse 19. And all the storage cities, let's see, we read that. He mentions here Lebanon. Okay, now Lebanon, um, we're going to see Hiram, his name here in just a little while again. And he's from Tyre, which is near Lebanon. And technically at that time, it was, a, it was an island off the coast. It was out into the Mediterranean. It was an island off the sea coast of, uh, if you want to say Lebanon. Phoenicia is, is the name that's sometimes used. And we'll see eventually one of these days, whether I'm in the teaching the class or someone else, that when we see Jezebel, that's where she comes from, is that area. It's a pagan area. Uh, so Hiram was from Tyre. Now, it's offshore, but not by much. It's out in, but it's in the Mediterranean. And so they would need, because there, at that time, there was no road to connect Tyre to the mainland and so they would need ships so we're going to read about the trade that goes on uh, during Solomon's time and Hiram was involved in that so any comments before we go on okay so we're looking at people and as we go on here we're going to see it just keeps going on and on and on about everything that Solomon or by extension, Israel had at their, at their command. These were people who originally, of course, this is hundreds of years later, but were shepherds. And now they've, they've come in, they're, they're in cities, walled cities. Some of them were, were walled, not all of them. They've come a long ways. Now they're city dwellers. They still have people in the countryside, but they, they have a lot of prosperity that's going on here. So that's what they're showing us, the opulence of all of these things. And these, you know, with good times while they're going on, it's like, boy, this is great, you know. So, verse 20. As for all the people who were left of the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, who were not of the sons of Israel, <clears throat> their descendants who were left after them in the land whom the sons of Israel were, una were unable to destroy utterly from them uh, Solomon levied forced laborers even to this day meaning the time when this was written so they didn't drive them all out as they should have but they did make them pay a price those that were not essentially organized or were not big enough to fight off the Israelites. So he, he made them slaves. Verse 22. But Solomon did not make slaves of the sons of Israel, for they were men of war, his servants, his princes, his captains, his chariot commanders, and his horsemen. These were the chief officers who were over Solomon's work, 550, who ruled over the people doing the work. As soon as Pharaoh's daughter came up from the city of David to her house, which Solomon had built for her, then he built the Milo. Okay, now, I mentioned last time, I think, and probably sometime before that, this would be a fortified area that it's mentioning here. Uh, one of the words that's used in later times would be a citadel. It's a fortified area usually an elevated area because it's more difficult for somebody in those days if you're attacking make them you know sometimes you see in the middle ages if you put a moat around there a water so you got to get through the water unless it's frozen but, but you got to get through the water then you usually you got to climb up a hill and it's like while they're doing all of this somebody's up above trying to to uh, destroy you so that's the kind of thing, but although it doesn't go into great detail, but that's what he's doing here. He's doing a fortified place. So 
She stayed in the city of David. Last time we talked about if you're a bird's eye view, you're up above, it would be, this would be um, the upper part of Jerusalem, east and west, the south. The city of David would be down in the south eastern corner. That's where the Gihon, or some people say Gion Spring was at, the source of water. And uh, that was the first part of Jerusalem that they captured, and that's where it gets its name, City of David. And so that's where she stayed until he was ready to continue. Any comments? Okay. Now, three times in a year, Solomon offered burnt offerings and peace offerings on the altar, which he built to the Lord, burning incense with them on the altar, which was before the Lord. So he finished the house. King Solomon also built a fleet of ships in Ezion Geber, which is near Eloth, on the shore of the Red Sea in the land of Edom. Okay, so Edom, is on the east side of the Jordan River, further down, and the Edom was populated predominantly by people who were descendants of Esau. And uh, so it's telling, it's trying to locate where this is. So if you have um, the Arabian Peninsula, which extends a long way down, you have sort of a Y shape. And the Arabian Peninsula would be down in here. On either side, there's water. That's a, there's a big different, uh, distance across there. And, uh, and on the top end of one of those fingers would be Aqaba. If you've ever seen uh, the, the movie Lawrence of Arabia, the big deal was we've got to get those guns in Aqaba because the British could not come in during the First World War easily with those huge uh, guns there. And so they went across the desert, uh, pretty difficult. They called it the Devil's Anvil. And uh, most people thought that it was impossible to do, and they captured these, these guns at the Gulf of Aqaba, which overlooked the uh, Mediterranean Sea. And so the British were able to come in after that. But that was the, the Arab troops that were led by Lawrence of Arabia. So that's on the one side. On the other side, though, we have um, around Egypt, east of Egypt, in those areas, we could see the other finger that comes up. So, it's talking about uh, where he had these ships. So, Hiram is mentioned in verse 27. He sent his servants with the fleet, sailors who knew the sea, along with the servants of Solomon. And they went to Ophir and took 420 talents of gold from there and brought it to King Solomon. Now there's a question about where Ophir is. And there's a, you know, uh, James Burton Kaufman, whose uh, commentary I've been using, as I mentioned before, he looks at uh, several people and he does not always agree with them, and he usually tells you why he doesn't agree. If he mentioned them, he doesn't always say uh, whether he agrees or not. But the one thing he talks about is some think, can't prove it, some think it may be as far away as India, where Ophir could be. But many people believe it would be a part of what we would call Southern Arabia, so that's just a possibility. But whatever it was, it wasn't anything close, and they needed a navy to be able to bring these things in. And so that's what you use for the trade route would be water. And we see how much uh, the Nile River was used, and even a part of the Mediterranean. The, as you would know, the Nile River flows north into the Mediterranean Sea. And so that's why we see the delta that expands where Alexandria was at and eventually uh, where Cairo is today, not on the coastline, but near the coastline. Uh, all of those things 
were important, but when you get close to uh, the sea, the Mediterranean Sea, water slows down. And when that happens, it begins to deposit whatever silt has been brought from further up the river. We see that. Uh, it's easier to see, like, when winter is ending, like up around Lake Erie, you may have flowing in through the uh, Lake Erie, you see ice build up. Why does it build up? Well, because there's ice out on the, the lake, and so what's trying to get into the lake can't get in, so everything backs up. It's the same idea, only we're talking about difference of silt versus ice, and the ice eventually melts and everything goes out. Any comments? Okay, so chapter 10. Now when the queen of Sheba heard about the fame of Solomon concerning the name of the Lord, she came to test him with difficult questions. Okay, now. There has been what we have written about Solomon and Queen of Sheba here. There have been a lot more writings about these two people. And we can't prove any of them. <laughs> we, could, we could prove this. We believe this for sure. But this only is kind of sketchy. But it just shows how people were coming to see what's going on here in this place that at one time were sheep herders. And so she wants to see, and so she came. Now, where is Sheba? It's a question mark. Some people think it's in the southwest. If you're looking down on it, like on a map, you can see Africa, and you can see Arabia and other areas. Some people think it's in the southwest part of the Arabian Peninsula, where present day we have, um, there's actually two countries, Yemen and South Yemen. And um, people talk about Osama bin Laden, that he was Saudi. Well, he wasn't Saudi, although he worked with the Saudis. His father worked with the Saudis. He was from Yemen. That's where he was from. Not much difference in people, but it's the idea. So some people think she was from down there. Now, nearby, there's a, if you look at where oil can be traded, we're talking about oil today, but trade route, what they call the Horn of Africa sticks out, and it looks like a horn. It's, it's kind of... It's east, way east of Egypt. You have the Sudan, and then you have this point that comes out on that continent. Somalia is there, and right next to Somalia, where that point is, is Ethiopia. Some people believe she's from Ethiopia. Uh, Josephus said she was from, she ruled Ethiopia and Egypt. So I don't know if they mean part of Egypt or all of Egypt, but we can't prove that. Okay, but it's, it gives you a rough idea. Even if she is from Ethiopia, there's that choke point. If you're talking about a trade route in the water, that is where the Arabian Peninsula and the Horn of Africa come together and there's a relatively small place there. Now, there's, if you're actually in that, there's miles and miles of water, but it's not like a huge, and that's a place if you wanted to bottle things up, that's what you'd try to do is choke that off. So we're not sure where she's from. Some, some think Ethiopia, some think Southwest Arabia. There are stories, well, let's, let's go on. And we'll, we'll stop and talk about it. I'm not saying I believe the stories. It's just so that you're aware of some of the things that have come up. Okay, so verse 2, unless you have something to say. Okay, verse 2. 
So she came to Jerusalem with a very large retinue with camels carrying spices and very much gold and precious stones. When she came to Solomon, she spoke with him about all that was in her heart. Solomon answered all her questions. Nothing was hidden from the king, which he did not explain to her. When the queen of Sheba perceived all the wisdom of Solomon, the house that he had built, the food of his table, the seating of his servants, the attendance of his waiters and their attire, his cup bearers and his stairway by which he went to the house of the Lord, there was no more spirit in her. Then she said to the king, it was a true report which I heard in my own land about your words and your wisdom. Nevertheless, I did not believe the reports until I came and my eyes have seen it. And behold, the half was not told me. You exceed in wisdom and prosperity the report which I heard. How blessed are your men. How blessed are these your servants who stand before you continually and hear your wisdom. Blessed be the Lord your God who delighted in you to set you on the throne of Israel. Because the Lord loved Israel forever, therefore he made you king to do justice and righteousness. She gave the king 120 talents of gold and a, great, a very great amount of spices and precious stones. Never again did such abundance of spices come in as that which the queen of Sheba gave Solomon. <coughs> Also, the ships of Hiram, which brought gold from Ophir, brought in from Ophir a very great number of almug trees and precious stones. Now, I don't have a footnote in this New American Standard Bible referring to these trees. Perhaps one of you have a footnote. In the King James Version that I have at home, the Note they have about almug is they've re, they changed it. It's called algum. So they've changed the M and the R around, left the U where it was. So whether that's accurate, according to uh, Brother Kaufman, nobody knows what they were. <laughs> they were they were useful. It describes all the things they used them for. But what would we call them today? I don't know. So maybe one of you have some something in your Bible that would say. If so, I'd be glad to hear it. Uh, the king made of the almug trees supports for the house of the Lord and for the king's house. Also lyres and harps for the singers. Such almug trees have not come in again, nor have they been seen to this day. King Solomon gave to the queen of Sheba Sheba all her desire which she requested besides what he gave her according to his royal bounty. Then she returned and went to her own land together with her servants. So it seemed like it was a congenial visit. Now rumors not we can't verify There are stories that say that she bore a child to, to Solomon, that, that that was one of the reasons she came there. She wanted to have a child by him. Who knows? Who knows? But the Ethiopians claim to this day that uh, she did have a child, and she was from Ethiopia. So I'm trying to tell you where these come from so that if you ever hear about it, it's like, well, okay, you know about it, but we can't prove any of this. And they claim, <clears throat> I don't remember his name for sure, it was something like Menelaus, that as he became older, was grown up, he went to visit Solomon, and when he came back, of course, he didn't go by himself. He had a retinue with him. <clears throat> And that he brought with him the Ark of the Covenant, which is kind of hard to believe. But that, so they claim in Ethiopia to this day at a place called Axum, there is a building. One man is allowed in there. And he claims 
well, he, he doesn't talk much, but they've got like a wall around. It's not a big building, uh, and it's not a dumpy building from the outside, but he has really severe cataracts. They claim that anybody who ever oversees this, what they claim is the ark in there, uh, that's one of the things that happens, they get cataracts. Well, we know today we can, we can deal with that medically. But um, so nobody's ever seen it other than whoever they select to be the person who takes care of that. So it's hard to imagine that he would be allowed to take the Ark of the Covenant out of, out of Jerusalem. I mean, if the priests are doing their job, somebody's going to notice uh, it's gone, you know. So let's, where did it go? Uh, and I don't think anybody was suggesting that Solomon gave it to him. So those are the stories you hear, though, but they cannot be proved. So I just wanted you to be aware of them, uh, that there are people who claim that the ark is in Ethiopia. So you would think um, back before, or I guess you could say at the start of the Second World War, depending when you want to fix a date, the Italians went into Ethiopia trying to conquer the country, and Haile Selassie, I don't know if you remember him, uh, he was the ruler, and one of the names he used was um, the Lion of the Tribe of Judah, which name is really reserved for Jesus. Uh, so, uh, when President Kennedy was assassinated and they had so many world leaders who showed up for the funeral, the procession, um, he was one of the people that was there. He walked in the, in the procession. Um, but he claimed that he was descended in lineage from Queen of Sheba. So. And he was, a, he was definitely a, a, a well-known person at the time. So, you have any comments before we go on? Okay. Now, um, verse 14. Now the weight of gold which came into Solomon in one year was 666 talents of gold. Beside that from the traders and the wares of the merchants and all the kings of the Arabs and the governors of the country. King Solomon made 200 large shields of beaten gold using 600 shekels of gold on each large shield. He made 300 shields of beaten gold using three minas of gold on each shield, and the king put them in the house of the forest of Lebanon. Moreover, the king made a great throne of ivory and overlaid it with refined gold. There were six steps to the throne and a round top to the throne at its rear, and the arms on and arms on each side of the seat, and two lions standing beside the arms. Twelve lions were standing there on the six steps on the one side, and on the other, nothing like it was made for any other kingdom. Uh, all King Solomon's drinking vessels were of gold, and all the vessels of the house of the forest of Lebanon were of pure gold. None of the silver, no, excuse me, none was of silver. It was not considered valuable in the days of Solomon. So um, that's, that's the way they, they pronounce it. Uh, in, in here it says it was, wasn't considered anything. <laughs> so I think it's the idea when you compare so much gold being used it was like, well, silver is nothing. Well, we know it is something. It's very important. Very hard. It's very hard. Gold is not. Uh, so, any comments before we go on? For the king had at sea the ships of Tars <coughs> Tarshish with the ships of Hiram. Once every three years, the ships of Tarshish came bringing gold and silver, ivory, and apes and peacocks. Okay. Now, Tarshish 
as most of you probably already know, is sometimes associated with what we call today Spain. There was um, a city very close in pronunciation to Tarshish, not quite that, but sometimes over, over time, pronunciation changed from culture to culture, but it, it still would be referring to what we would call Spain today. And they were they were uh, trading with such things, and if this is by memory, I might be wrong on this. I believe that when uh, when uh, Jonah was fleeing, he was he got on a ship heading for Tarshish. It's, he went the other way. God wanted him to go, <laughs> go to Nineveh. And since we're talking about that, go to Nineveh. Okay, you've heard of we. Since we've had our troops in the Middle East for some time now, um, you might say, well, okay, where was, where was Nineveh located? Well, present day, we know that we had troops in what they call Mosul, which was up north in Iraq, further north. It is not Tarshish. Excuse me, it's, it is not Nineveh. It's across the river from Nineveh. They're both on the Tigris River, and they'd be like Minneapolis, St. Paul. One's on one side of the river, one's on the other side of the river. So the Tigris River runs through there. And back when ISIS, several years ago, uh, took over Nineveh, they were destroying some of the archaeological treasures that were there, not that we would say that they were things that we would want to save for religious sake, but they're just artifacts from a past time. And they destroyed a lot of that because in the Muslim faith, the way that they viewed it, that's what you have to do, you destroy that. So they blew up a lot of this, destroyed a lot of that sort of thing. But not related to what we're doing here, but if uh, Jonah was fleeing, he was headed absolutely opposite direction than, than God wanted him to go. Going to Tarshish. Comments? Okay, so. Uh, eventually, and I didn't take time to look this up, but um, eventually, when times become tough, we will see these shields of gold that we've just been reading about they're going to be replaced. They need the gold. They need the gelt. I think the the Germans would say, the gelt. Uh, they need that. So they took some brass. They made it uh, these shields of brass and shined them up. Looks pretty close. It's the same thing, but it's certainly not worth as much. And that happens many years from the time we're reading about now. Um, let's see. Twenty-three. So King Solomon became greater than all the kings of the earth in riches and in wisdom. All the earth was seeking the presence of Solomon to hear his wisdom which God had put in his heart. They brought every man his gift, articles of silver and gold, garments, weapons, spices, horses and mules, so much year by year. Now Solomon gathered chariots and horsemen, and he had 1,400, excuse me, 1,400 chariots and 12,000 horsemen, and he stationed them in the chariot cities and with the king in Jerusalem. The king made silver as common as stones in Jerusalem, and he made cedars as plentiful as sycamore trees that are in the lowland. Also, Solomon's import of horses was from Egypt and Chu, and the king's merchants procured them from Chu for a price. A chariot was imported from Egypt for 600 shekels of silver and a horse for 150. And by the same means, he exported them to the kings of the Hittites and the kings of the Arameans. So, now, the Hittites, generally speaking, would be in what we would call today Turkey. And so 
when we read about Uriah the Hittite when we, during the time of David, it's like, well, he's kind of, although these people could be anywhere, he's kind of out of his normal place that you would expect to find him. Uh, but an individual, that isn't such a big deal. It's groups, large groups, unless they uh, have an army there, it's, that's different. And Hittites were known in many centuries past to go to war with uh, Egypt at times. And of course, one of the battles that Ramses II fought was in Kadesh in Israel. So, uh, and he claimed that they won the battle. And so I've said before, I think I told you he reigned for 64 years and I found out that is not correct. He was ruled for 66 years, so that's my fault. So, ruled a long time. And so the, a lot of people would say, well, who's gonna argue with him? I mean, how many people outlived him, do you suppose? I don't know. So it's just another way of looking at it. But it's showing here the how much influence he has Solomon and as a result Israel and what his reach was he's going all these different places they have trading going on all of these places so they've they've come a long ways and uh, chapter 11 which we're not going to get into tonight the I've mentioned before I have certain places maybe you have in your Bible as well bold print Especially, we know for sure at the beginning of a chapter, and then partway through, as things change a little bit, there'll be another bold statement. So, the one I have before it starts, chapter 11 Solomon turns from God. So, that's what we're going to be seeing, Lord willing, next week. So, appreciate comments, your attention tonight.
Good evening and welcome to our Wednesday evening Bible study, worship services. We are thankful that you are able to assemble and to be here to sing and praise our Heavenly Father. You might be visiting with us, if that be the case. If you wouldn't mind, would you please fill out a visitor's card and leave that with us as you leave the building this evening. It's good to see you, Caleb, and everybody back uh, in their normal routine, as well as others who've been on the sick list as well. Considering the sick list, uh, you can see on my left, uh, Ruth McAwee will be having surgery coming up next week. Abby Bryan will also be having some foot surgery on the 21st. Bonnie Stemmel has to request your prayers for herself, as well as her parents, brother, and daughter, Heather. Please keep Tracy Taylor in your prayers as she continues to recover. Also, Juanita Clark, also Brother Ron and Janet Simmons as they have health issues at this time. I'm sure that there are others that perhaps we are not aware of. Has any name been missed that you may know of to re report or to mention at this time? We have no other announcements that I'm aware of. Do you have any? If not, Brother Jason will have our songs Anthony Boner will have our prayer, Caleb the lesson, Steve Parker our dismissal. If you would please follow along as we enter into our services. Thank you. Evening. We're going to sing 449, Thy Word. And we'll have our uh, scripture and prayer and uh, lesson. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto Father in heaven, we are so thankful for this beautiful day that you bless us with, and we are especially thankful for this time and opportunity that we have this evening to gather together uh, to study from your word and to worship you. Heavenly Father, we just ask that you would continue to watch over the church here. We pray for our elders and, and their leadership. We pray that you continue to watch over and bless them, that they would turn to you for, um, for guidance. Heavenly Father, we pray for our, our deacons and the work that's been set before them. We pray for for our members. We pray that we would continue to be a light to this community. Heavenly Father, there are many that are on our, our prayer list that we pray for at this time. We know that there are many suffering or about to go through uh, surgeries or treatments. We pray that you be with our sister uh, Ruth McAwee as she's preparing to, um, or she's going through uh, surgery and, and recovering. We pray that you would be with her uh, pray for uh, Abby Bryan as she's going to be having foot surgery. Um, we pray for our sister Bonnie Stimmel as she's requested prayers. Pray for herself, for for her family members. Um, just be continue to be with her and her family. Heavenly Father, we ask at this time she be with uh, Tracy Taylor as she continues to recover. Pray that her health health would be restored and she'd be able to return again with us. Heavenly Father, we also pray for. Uh, the Simmons, Ron and Janet, we know that they're struggling with their health, health at this time. Pray that you would uh, continue to be with them and uh, be with those caring for them. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful that we have um, your love and the love of your son. We're so thankful that Jesus loved us so much that he was willing to um, come to this earth and live a perfect life and, and die upon that cross for our sins. We pray that each and every day that we would look at his example, we would dive into your word and 
understand how you'd have us live and, and bring other souls to you. Heavenly Father, we pray for this country. We pray for uh, the freedoms that we have. We pray that those would never be taken from us. Heavenly Father, we pray for those that are uh, sacrificing their safety and their lives for our freedoms. Um, Heavenly Father, we just ask you would continue with us throughout this service and throughout the rest of this week. Again, we are so thankful for Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. It is really good to be back. Uh, for a second, my Bible was upside down. I can't read it like that. Uh, really good to see you. I, I tell you what, it's really strange being at home watching from the TV when I'm supposed to be in here on the pul- in the pulpit. Uh, but I really enjoyed being able to worship with you, even though I was stuck at home, and I, you know, Sammy was there too, as you know. Um, thankful for your thoughts and your prayers. Uh, we didn't suffer that bad this time. Just, just one day, really, is how bad it was. But we had a few days of getting it out of our system, so I, you know, so I wouldn't come in here and be called COVID breath. Uh, you think that's funny, but somebody called me that, so <laughs> they were just messing. Don't worry. I'm not going to tell you who it was. Before I get started, I want to tell you a little bit of a story, but if you want to turn your Bibles to Psalm, Psalm 139, we're going to look at verses 23 and 24 here in just a little bit. A little girl was misbehaving on a plane during a flight, and she was just running up and down the aisle like she didn't have anything uh, to restrain her. She didn't care. She was just having a blast. Finally, she climbed over one of the seats, uh, one of the empty seats and fell, but on her way down, she kicked a man in the head. So, of course, the flight attendant got upset and came and had to escort the child back to her flustered mom. So her mom grabbed her and put her down in the seat and told her that she needed to sit still, calm down, or there will be a price to pay. Well, it didn't take very long as the girl was sitting there. She crossed her arms and she just started to smile real sly like she was up to something. So her mom looked down thinking she was going to be rebellious and uh, said, now listen, I don't know what you're thinking about but I'd like to know why you're smiling. And the daughter said, it's because I may be sitting on the outside, but I am still running around on the inside. I think this is an excellent uh, illustration for the way people can be. Sometimes we can be a certain way on the outside, but be a certain way on the inside. Those two things, those two ways, could be drastically different from one another. When we read about God's Word, or we read from God's Word, and we see what it is that is expected of us as Christians, we see that there is a decent amount of things, but life is really kind of simple when you think about what Christianity does for you and what what it has to offer, and of course the end goal, to get to heaven. And we think all of the trouble, all of the difficulty is worth it, but sometimes people get wrapped up in worldly things. Sometimes even Christians who are 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 as faithful as they can be, can sometimes become distracted. And if we allow that distraction distraction to continue or or this different way of thinking, this worldly living, it's going to change who we are, maybe not on the outside, but it's certainly going to change who we are on the inside. The thing, too, that we need to remember, and I think part of the problem with sin is that we, we think when we're about to sin or while we're sinning that nobody is watching. And that's what makes it worth it because nobody knows my shame. But we forget that God does. We forget that God sees everything. We've talked a little bit about it in our Bible class tonight of God's omniscience, that he is all-knowing. He knows us. He knows what what we are on the inside, even if we're not showing it on the outside. So what I want to encourage you to do, and I'm not calling anyone out. I'm not suggesting that anyone here is unfaithful or there's sin in your life or any of that. But I always want to encourage us to, myself, I said us on purpose, I want always to encourage us to draw closer to God, to be sure that our relationship is as what it's supposed to be, that we're doing the things that God wants us to do. And sometimes we have to admit that we were wrong so that we can change it. Now going to Psalm 139, these two verses, verse 23 and 24. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties. And see if there is any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. The Lord knows our heart. And what the psalmist is suggesting is not really to learn things that you don't already know about me, but rather so that that they would be closer, that they would be connected. This feeling of knowing that God was aware of what was going on, knowing that it was only God who could aid him the way that he needed, 
This is a realization that we need to have. If we want to remain strong, if we want to remain faithful, if we want to remain good in our lives, we must always focus on God. We must make sure that the inside matches the outside. And what happens if it doesn't? Well, the psalmist, I think, points it out to us, but we see it through in the New Testament many times that we need to lay that on God, lay that burden on God. We need to repent of our sin. We need to confess it to God so that He can forgive it, so that what we're trying to be or what we're professing to be on the outside is exactly what we are on the inside because that's what matters. When we stand before God on the judgment day, God isn't going to say, well, I'm going to let you go into heaven because I'm going to let you have eternal, uh, eternal peace or rest because you pretended so well. We know that's not the case. So I want to encourage you tonight to allow God to search your heart, allow his word to guide you. As the Hebrew writer says, that's its intent is to pierce the soul, to uh, divide it, you know, to, wait, to open us up and see what the issue is and fix it. So, one, you must confess that tonight. You must admit that there's something that needs changing, but you also have to take the word of God for what it is. And, the, and uh, Paul tells Timothy that it's profitable for doctrine, for instruction, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. He says that a man of God may be perfect, thoroughly equipped unto all good works. You must apply what you read as well. So let the word open up your heart to realize the wrong that is there and then allow it to assist you in fixing it. Your first goal ought to be to be forgiven of that sin, but you may have to work hard for now on, from now on so that you can avoid it again. So please come tonight if there's a need for you. If you are not a Christian, I always try to make a habit. I want to make a habit until the day I quit preaching, whatever, you know, if I drop dead or whatever happens. I never want to steer away from extending the invitation because if I had never received the invitation, I have no idea where I would be. And I don't want to leave anybody. I don't want anybody to walk out of this place if never hearing what the Lord has to offer. Now, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, or that's where it's recorded, Come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. What does that mean? That doesn't mean that I can do whatever I want, and then as long as I lay that on Christ, let him take care of it, things will be good. Things will be the best that they can be. Now, I have to commit myself to Christ. I must conform to the word of God rather than being transformed by the world. And I may have gotten that backwards from the scripture, but the idea is the same. So tonight, come, repenting of your sins. If you're not a Christian, believe what the Bible tells you about Jesus Christ as the Son of God and that he came and died for you because without that belief and without baptism, a man cannot be saved. So if you do believe, please come, repent of your sins. And I've been thinking so much about repentance because of, you know, when I study with someone who becomes a Christian and then they seem totally uninterested in biblical things, even the church, right away, it makes me wonder if they've ever truly repented. So I want to encourage you to think about repentance tonight as well uh, before you commit yourself to God. If you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and you're willing to repent, come confess that faith and be baptized for the remission of your sins. Those are the things that are needed for salvation. Of course, Jesus says in Revelation 2 verse 10, Be faithful unto death and I will give you a crown of life, which tells us that we always have to be faithful until we die. So if you're willing to do that, please come and be baptized in the death of Jesus Christ, raised to walk in like his resurrection and newness of life, be a part of his kingdom so that you can see God one day lit in eternity by the glory of God. If you're here tonight as a Christian and there's sin in your life or if, if this subject tonight has uh, struck a chord with you, come forward and ask us to encourage you. We'll pray for you. If there's sin, please confess it to God and he will forgive it. Whatever you need is, come as we stand and sing. Three verses, 514. Redeem thou I love to proclaim it. Redeem thou the blood of the Lamb. Redeem through his infinite mercy. It shall end forever I am. Redeem, redeem. Redeem by the blood of the Lamb. Redeem, redeem. redeem. It shall end Redeemed and so happy in Jesus, no language.
number seven, 474. Thank you, Lord. Three verses, then we'll close in prayer. Thank you, Lord, for loving me, and thank you, Lord, for blessing me. Thank you, Lord, for making me whole and saving my soul. I want to thank you, Lord, for loving me. Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Let us all with one accord sing praises to Christ the Lord. Let us all unite in song to praise him all day long. I want to thank you, Lord, for loving me. Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Please reveal your will for me so I can serve you for eternity. Use my life in every way. Take hold of it today. To thank you, Lord, for loving me. Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Shall we close in prayer? Almighty Heavenly Father, we come to you at the close of this service, thanking you, Father, for this day that you've given us. Thank you, Father, for this opportunity that we've had here tonight to gather with other Christians here in this building, Father, and and uh, learn more about you, Father, from our studies and to worship you tonight. We thank you so much for this opportunity and pray that uh, we never take this opportunity lightly, Father. Father, <clears throat> I want to again asked uh, be with those that are on our sick list we do have many father uh, we're thankful for the ones that uh, have recovered and are able to be back with us again but we still have many that are confined to homes to nursing homes father uh, we have several that are going through procedures soon uh, we just pray that you be with them father and help us uh, help them also be with us father the rest of this week if you will uh, may we have a good week uh, may we represent you well, Father, and uh, if we have that opportunity, may we touch uh, people and help them uh, learn the errors of their way and uh, that they turn their life over to you, Father. I want to thank you so much for everything, especially for your son. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.